My name is Adrian Quiney, and I winter between 60 to 80 colonies in the area around Hudson, Wisconsin, in the US. And this is not a simple recipe type presentation. I'm going to draw upon all of my life experiences and use the metaphor of a dispute between a union and a management to challenge you to think about how we keep bees in our region. I want you to think, I want to make you think. It was a challenging task to write this and I hope that the 40 minutes it takes won't be too challenging to listen to it. When we begin beekeeping, many of us in our middle age, we each bring a unique perspective and we don't leave those life lessons behind when we open a hive. Many of them may be more useful in beekeeping than you realize. I'm 56. I spent 15 years at a company in the UK. And for the first five years in, a, in an accountancy office, my boss, Harold Matthews, would call me into his office and ask me what I was working on. And when I answered, he would smirk and say, why? And then I would answer and he would smirk again and say, why? And this would go on and on, driving me crazy. What my 15 year old self didn't realize is that he was teaching me what today is known as critical thinking. Learning to question what and why has led my beekeeping along a different path. My last five years at that company was spent planning and supervising the manufacture of very sticky adhesives and sealants in the factory. And that planning experience along with the sticky experience has been very useful. These are my beekeeping notebooks. Here in the US, for the last 20 years, I've been, been employed as a nurse, an RN. In nursing, the maxim is, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. Making notes is vital in beekeeping as well. And also, as an RN, I have helped negotiate contracts between our union, the Minnesota Nurses Association, and the hospital systems. Let me explain to you how that relates to beekeeping. I've been keeping bees since 2008, and throughout this time, a perpetual debate, which predates me, has raged. How much treatment do the bees need? Where do we look for answers to winter losses? The beekeepers or the bees themselves? For me, this came to a head at Apimondia, a worldwide beekeeping conference this past fall in Montreal. I had the pleasure of listening to a lot of speakers, including Tom Seeley, who has been studying wild bees in, the New, York, in New York State since the 1970s. He spoke about a quite hands-off method of beekeeping which included allowing colonies to swarm and limiting the colony size. This didn't go down well with everyone. First, in the article in December's American Bee Journal, Peter Loring Borst starts by saying, the assumption that natural selection will automatically produce a survivor type B is based on incomplete understanding. He goes on, to give an example, Santa Cruz Island, where Varroa were introduced to wipe out honeybees, and they did. And then further, he goes on to describe the live and let die experiment in Sweden, where the colonies did eventually evolve to survive Varroa by swarming often and remaining small. Under conventional thinking, swarmy, small colonies are undesirable. And for much of recent history, beekeepers have been trying to grow and develop large, non-swarmy colonies. And when he introduces the work of Tom Seeley into the article, he says Tom proposes to do away with most of the beekeeping techniques we employ as progressive beekeepers. Now, Tom Seeley advocates keeping the colonies small. And further on, Peter Loring Bors goes on to use the loaded language of beekeeper versus bee haver. He sees incorporating Varroa resistant lines into modern beekeeping practices as the most promising goal. The 
there was another article in December's Bee Culture. Ed Colby summarised his objection to the Seeley's approach this way. I'll read you the actual, actual article because it is really well written. At lunch, Marilyn burst my bubble. Darwinian beekeeping is like putting a squirrel in a cage. If you are not going to get any honey, why put bees in a box? I immediately grasped her point. If your isolated location is conducive to bees survival, feral bees should be there in just the right numbers. Why not leave well enough alone? Why would you bring in your own bees to introduce diseases and parasites? All this for little or no honey. I suppose it boils down to why we keep bees in the first place. These non-native creatures do so much good. But in a sense, aren't managed bees just livestock that we nurture, feed and protect to improve our crop yields and give us honey to eat? And if they contract disease or parasites, isn't it our responsibility as beekeepers to intervene on their behalf, just like we would for a sick dog or cow? Don't get me wrong, Tom Seeley's Darwinian bees make my heart sing. They made it to the golden shore. Evolution needn't take a million or even a thousand years. Right before our very eyes, testify to the elegance of natural selection. I say, God bless them, but they're not good honey producers. And the places where we need bees the most, our agricultural lands, are precisely the places where Darwinian bees can't survive. Maybe you too dream of wild bees foraging in the treetops, foraging where they will, but there's no point putting them in boxes. We shouldn't even try. Ed is a wonderful writer and that was really well written. So, whether you are a new or experienced beekeeper, the question is the same. Should we manage bees intensively or lightly? Which is the better path for hobbyists and small, small sideliners in the upper Midwest? Manage for maxim, maximum production, count mites frequently and apply treatments, or manage lightly, take less honey, let them swarm and lay off the chemicals. What's a beekeeper to think? Who do you listen to and what path should you take? I'm going to explain how a compromise can be negotiated. A compromise that has worked for me and might meet the needs of more of us here. Let's look at this dispute through a metaphor. Beekeepers often wonder what the bees do over winter. Well, these bees spent the winter making signs and on a warm day in spring, they came out and marched in front of their workplace and aired their grievances. The management was embarrassed, which of course was the intention as the bees explained that they weren't going to take it anymore. They were lined up in front of the hive and marched back and forth. At first, local beekeepers thought it was washboarding. Then they looked closer and saw the bees had signs. It wasn't washboarding, it was a picket line. The bees were protesting and making a point, a prelude, a warning. Pay attention to us. The picketing carried on for a while and those with good eyes could read the signs. The bees hadn't held a picket before and they started with fairly innocuous protest signs that made a point but didn't offend anyone in particular. But as spring progressed into summer, the bees became increasingly frustrated and the messages became a little more aggressive and a little more confrontational. Some of the beekeepers started to get offended that their authority was getting challenged. Some were insulted. It started to get a little too much. And the picket line grew as summer recruitment added more and more bees to the line. Workers join a picket line for many reasons, and the danger is that you can attract anarchists and agitators. There was even talk of Russian bee interference from Facebook. Reluctantly, management agreed to meet with them to see if they could come to an agreement. In a dispute, it is helpful to identify the participants. The participants in this case are the audience of sideline hobbyist beekeepers, um, you lot, the convention, representing conventional management in the Midwest, uh, bees, the workers of the Midwest, and myself, 
Adrian the Presenter. The sole job of the mediator is to get an agreement and he doesn't care about the feelings of either party. He wants to avoid a strike or if there is a strike to get the parties back to the table and thus back to work as soon as possible. A mediator speaks to both parties in the dispute and hears all the frustrations and has to lay it all out there. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay it all out there. Now, in a dispute, the mediator has to have some credibility with both sides and some understanding of the problem. And let's get back to the dispute. In a dispute, there is often a lot of dramatic posturing and it is quite common for both sides to put out statements to try to influence public opinion. This is the management's opening statement. It is our intention to come to an agreement with the bees, yet it would be remiss of us not to say why we have difficulty understanding why the bees would want to unionize. We provide shelter and supplies to the bees, treatments are applied and mites are counted. There really is no need for a union, the bees have it easy. Whereas the union's opening statement, we, the worker bees, are overworked and our basic needs have been ignored for too long at the expense of management's incessant demands for higher productivity at lower cost. Management has dusted, sprayed, dribbled on, and even acid gassed us, all in ill-advised schemes to rid of us parasites. We are told it is in our best interests, yet half of us die each year. With this contract, we hope to remedy the insanity that brings in thousands of out-of-state workers every year who would take the jobs that our local sisters could be doing if management understood our needs. It's time to say the emperor is naked and start anew with an agreement of practices that reflect the interests of both parties. As you see, the bees really went for it and took no prisoners. Now, the next step in negotiations was the, for the parties to clarify the items that they want to see in an agreement. These are called demands or proposals and in negotiations both, both parties want something and both parties often ask for more than they can get. So some proposals are known as throwaway proposals, proposals that you discard in a negotiation to make it appear that you are conceding something. The management's uh, proposals were kept deliberately vague because they weren't really looking to make any real changes. In off-the-record conversations with the mediator, they acknowledged concerns about excessive winter losses and the hypocrisy of asking gardeners and farmers to restrict the use of their pesticides while they continue to put chemicals in their hives. But the conventional management didn't believe that anything of note could be changed. The group of conventional beekeeper educators were reticent to talk about their own individual winter losses. They seemed to lay the blame for these winter losses at the feet of ineffective management. Beekeepers who failed to follow the prescribed regimen of count, treat, count, treat, count, treat, count, treat, and count again. And winter losses gave the mediator an opening. Addressing colony losses was an area of common ground for both the bees and the beekeepers. In a dispute, data is important. In this instance, both conventional beekeeping management and the bees recognize that the best set of data we have has been reported to the Bee Informed Partnership every year since 2007 by beekeepers across the United States. It is accessible online and searchable using a variety of criteria. Both the, beekeeper, both the union and the management agreed to use this as a reference material. They agreed to use the cumulative data and to focus on sideliner and hobby management beekeepers because the bees of commercial beekeepers are always on the move they have non-union bees and they face different problems. The data showed that from 2007 to 2019, backyarders lost 58% of their colonies and the sideliners 47% in Minnesota and Wisconsin. 
I understand that beekeepers are classified as backyarders if they have less than 50 colonies. As you can see, there is a lot of information on these pages, and so I'll flash you the pages as they appeared on my computer, and then focus on the pertinent data on a separate slide. Like that. Now, backyarders lost 58% and sideliners 57%. And that should not be a big surprise. When you read this as a fraction, you can see that on average, half of the bees die each year. For Minnesota and Wisconsin, that data came from 2,200 backyard responders and 163 sideline responders. The backyarders managed 16,714 colonists and the sideliners 22,538. So this is a, a large sample. Let's compare monitoring for Varroa. Does the active mon monitoring for Varroa help? The hobbyists who monitored lost 57% and those who didn't lost 60%. Both the beekeepers and the bees agreed that they wouldn't expect that the act of monitoring by itself would make a difference. Rather, it should be the doing of something that should make a difference. And there is a clue to that here. It seems that all the sideliners monitor for Varroa, as the did not monitor line is blank because there are so few sideliners that they didn't print any statistics there. So let's move from counting to treatment. The sideliners who um, monitor for Varroa lost 47%. Now, this slide compares backyard treatment. For backyarders, those who treated lost 54%, and those who didn't lost 62%. Monitoring and treated, treating only improved survival by 8%. And that was shocking to the management, but not news to the bees. For sideliners, treating improved survival by almost twice as much. Twice as much sounds good, doesn't it? The data shows a 15% increase in survival between those who treated and those who didn't. The management and the bees agreed on something. Winter losses were terrible. Roughly half the bees were dying each year, no matter what the management did. What they acknowledged was that treating or not, and monitoring or not, the likelihood of any given colony surviving the winter was no better than a coin toss. This data provoked a lot of discussion. Who was to blame? Was it that the bees were too weak? In one study, a chemical manufacturer blamed queen losses on fragile queens. Really? Queens are expected to be chemical proof now? The bees found this insulting. Beekeeper educators blamed their students. They were too lazy or busy to adhere to the regimen they were taught. And beekeeper students wondered then if beekeeping teachers were so smart did they, why did they themselves need to buy bees? Conspiracy theorists blamed the, said it was all an industry plot to keep everyone buying bees. Others blamed the universities. They were too busy addressing the concerns of commercial beekeepers to be bothered about the hobbyists and sideliners. Someone asked how it was that basic beekeeping methods <coughs> hadn't really changed for 60 years or longer despite these losses. After allowing an appropriate opportunity for venting, the mediator moved the parties on to see what basic facts they agreed on. What were beekeepers actually doing or trying to do each year? What conventional hobbyists and sideliners do each year? Even though there was some divergence amongst the conventional bee bee beekeeping management represented, this list showed the components of their beekeeping.
They kept large colonies year-round. They split in the spring. They harvest honey in the fall. They overwinter and they count mites and apply in high pesticides throughout the season. And this is the status quo, so to speak. Now, in private, when the bees weren't listening, the conventional based beekeepers discussed their internal conflicts with the mediator. Even though most of them didn't migrate their bees, the methods they use copy those of commercial migratory beekeepers. There was a willingness in principle to try something new, but a fear of failing. The mediator was blunt. They're already failing. The chemical methods they put so much faith in are not keeping their bees alive in large colonies. Moreover, the compressed season here in the northern part of the United States means that the bees are unavailable for chemical treatment for half the year anyway. Perhaps they should consider listening to the bees to try something new and avoid a costly strike and all the negative publicity it would entail. Likewise, in private, the bees explained to the mediator that this was their bottom line. They knew that in the contiguous forests of the Northeast United States, in parts of Europe, in Russia and in Brazil, bees were continuing to do what they had for millennia. They lived in small cavities, they swarmed and they did this without chemicals. Yet when those same bees were taken from those conditions and forced to be in large colonies, they died at the same rates that all the others do. Why? Why spend so much effort to keep bees in large hive systems year round if it is clear that the large hive system itself favours a fatal mite virus combo at the expense of the bees? What is the point of trying to breed a bee to fit a system? Why not change the system to fit the bee? The bees pointed out that bees have tolerated different forms of management for five to 10,000 years. Yet current beekeeping management is stuck on this particular method of beekeeping that's only been around for 170 years. Surely management could think outside of the standard 10 frame box. The mediator got the parties back together and summarized goals they had in common. The bees and the management agreed on these basic things. Bees need to survive, bees should multiply, and bees should make honey. Finally, the parties in this dispute agree to move forward, to collaborate on win-win solutions with the goal of improving winter survival from a half to two thirds. A TA is a tentative agreement something the parties agree on as they progress along a path towards a solution. The key thing to note in this is the compromise. The bees union pointed out that bees have a biological need to satisfy the urge to reproduce. Management, in a private caucus out of earshot, remembered the days when, as young humans, they were tormented by raging hormones themselves and accepted that the urge to reproduce is both natural and unavoidable. However, management retains the right to determine where that queen cell came from. The bees insisted that management gave up on the fool's errand of trying to beat Midwest weather. Queen reading should wait until summer begins in the warmer months of June and July. Now, despite the data presented earlier, management showed an extreme reluctance to change the cavity size. At the bargaining table, this got quite heated. Management objected to the cost and the extra work involved, and the bees were quite direct, even insulting, accusing management of being stuck in the 1960s before Varroa, having delusions of grandeur, preparing that they didn't have the, pretending they didn't have the time, how many colonists did they think they managed? Hundreds? Thousands? Of course not. Most of them had less than 10 colonists. What was the point of having a hobby or a sideline if it doesn't take time? 
But being managers and very cost conscious, what finally swung this one was the economic argument that Breeze brought with them. That based upon the BIP data, half of the colonists are likely to die. And if one continues to winter in large hives, expecting them to survive and be split in the spring, then each hive that dies is actually two dead hives, both the colony and the potential split. If colonies are divided in the summer or fall and winter to smaller units and half of them die, a beekeeper is unlikely to need replacements. So this became the compromise, the cavity compromise. Think of the 10 frame box as the temporary expanded network. Small hives until late spring, large hives through the summer, small hives from August until spring again. Here's um, a picture of what it looks like. My daughter Ella drew rather unflattering pictures of me. Um, we only actually need the largest population of bees in May, June and July. After that, they do perfectly fine in a cavity of the volume the research says they would choose in the wild, which is roughly the volume occupied by 10 deep frames. So you can see from that that in February, March and April, the bees are in five over five frame colonies. The beekeeper sits in his recliner. In, in May, June or July, you move from and make splits, run honey producers, and have smaller colonies. And then in the fall, in late part of the winter, you're just checking on your five over five colonies. No. Oops, I went the wrong way around. Here you prepare for winter in five over fives, bring them together, and on and on it goes. Now, TA number three, no replacement workers unless all the colonists are dead. This was another difficult and heated argument. From the bees' perspective, management seemed oblivious to the invisible hitchhikers that travel from outstate each year. Varroa mites and their attendant viruses. What is the sense in buying the latest chemical proof Varroa mite virus combo and bringing that back to your surviving colonies. The union was asking that the management use the bees that survive to replace the bees that die, to split them and requeen with locally raised cells. Once again, it was the economic argument that took hold. Replacement bees are expensive and it's time for a change. Biotechnical mic controls first and chemical controls as a last resort. What allowed this TA to take hold was that management finally acknowledged that they were tired of being hypocritical chemical applicators. They came into beekeeping not knowing that A, that experts believed that chemicals were mandatory, necessary and essential, and that B, that chemically treating the bees in our region isn't significantly improving survival for non-migratory beekeepers. Biotechnical methods are those that don't use chemicals. The use of drone frames is an example of a biotechnical intervention. The frame is put in and when the drone pupa is sealed, it can be cut out and put back in, or the whole frame can be pulled out and, and frozen. Uh, this is an aside. When uh, we were cleaning out the family freezer in January, I pulled out and cut apart a drone frame I had frozen. I took the opportunity to take a family photo. Drone comb removal can be quite effective. It was for this particular family. In the lower cell, you can see the brown Varroa mother, also known as the foundress mite, and then the larval stages of the mite. I learned that during the first larval stage, it, it is called a protonymph, and the second larval stage is called a deutonymph. 
I misheard that at first and thought it was a doo-doo nymph because they hang out by the doo-doo. Seriously, that's where they meet and mate. Now let's move back to the tentative agreement. Queen stock from gentle survivors with at least one mite resistant feature. VSH, hygienic behavior, mite chewing, and capping, recapping. The parties agreed that it was unfair to place all of the burden of mite control on either the management or the bee's genetics. It needed to be a partnership, and to that end, the bees agreed that they would accept queen stock that showed an ability to reduce mite numbers. It didn't really matter to each party which specific mechanism the bees used to resist mites over the long winter. They just need to be doing something about mites other than making signs. What mattered was that the bees were alive in the spring. Once the early TAs and drama were passed, the mediator expected that this last TA would pass easily. It no longer made sense to keep training beekeepers in the traditional manner unless your interest was in selling bees or selling chemicals. Bees usually enter the life of lives of humans when they are older, more conservative and more trained to defer to authority. Beekeepers are usually only going to take one introductory course and then judge all they learn against that. As older people are more conservative to begin with, to tell them that the methods they were taught are, are demonstrably unreliable and unsuccessful, that they lead, need to learn something else. Who wants to hear that uncomfortable truth? I'm a member of a couple of local clubs, the Minnesota Hobby Beekeepers Association and the Honey Bee Club of Stillwater. And thanks to the Honey Bee Club of Stillwater, Minnesota, I recently had the privilege to listen to Randy Oliver. And he said quite a few things. He said that one should listen to beekeepers whose biggest problem in the spring most years is too many breeds. I can get behind that. However, he also said, word to the effect that as a beekeeper educator, you shouldn't tell people what to do, you should suggest. I don't agree with that because I hate waste, death and sadness. It's time for a significant change. Beekeeping as practiced in this area is not working consistently for non-migratory beekeepers and non-migratory bees. Let's reinvent what it means to be a non-migratory beekeeper. What often gets overlooked in labor negotiations is that an initial agreement between the management and the workers' representatives is only provisional until the members get to vote on it. And the voting itself is called ratification. In this case, the workers had agreed that in order for the contract to become ratified, two thirds of the colonies from a pilot program need to be alive in the spring. My bees have approved this process. I go into winter with more small colonies than I need and sell the excess in the spring. Since 2010, by using nuke principles from Michael Palmer and brood breaks from Mel Disselkin, in 2017, I added further mic control from Dutch and German researchers and I plan to go on to refine these methods. I've proved to myself that it can be done and I believe that others could have more consistent success if they made some changes. Current migratory current practices are not working consistently for non-migratory beekeepers and non-migratory bees. It's time for a different approach. If you want to learn a little more about the sources I referenced, I recommend that you read the articles in the journals. Tom Seeley's uh, excellent book and watch the video on sustainable varroa management by Ralph Buckler. And it, no talk that I would give 
um, should would be complete without giving credit to Michael Palmer of Vermont for opening my eyes to the value of using skinny nucleus colonies, and also Mel Disselkin of Michigan for his work on non-conventional Varroa mite control. One reference that I um, did, don't have on my slide is, is, I will read it to you, and if you Google Varroa mites and how to catch them, here is the method used to kill 95% of the mites in a hive. And it's by a Dutch university, and the author, uh, are, authors are Callis, C-A-L-I-S, and Beatsma. I'm just going to see if I can bring this into focus. And that is it there. Okay. And on that note, thank you very much.